I won the scholarship. There was a lot of local press around it, which I think the entire Haitian community was, or at least around me, was very proud of. But literally, the day after I won the scholarship, um, President Trump ended temporary protective status for Haitian immigrants, for about 60,000 Haitian immigrants, which makes them um, eligible for deportation come the summer of 2019. So imagine, um, we have this narrative of the American dream of immigrants coming to this country and um, building a successful path for their parents. And I can remember opening the day's news, and there was a photo of my face right next to a photo of um, or a story of families that were facing deportation who are from the same community that I'm from. So I will leave the uh, very specific legal details to what all of that means to the experts on the panel, but I think in thinking about how to push forward, we do need to consider um, the ways in which we can protect our communities, the ways in which we can explicitly um, display the value of our communities, not from exceptional, just exceptional narratives like mine, but narratives like my parents who are just normal people who come here and who contribute and who do their work as being good community members and how important that is for um, not only our Haitian community and our local communities, but um, our American ethic in general. So thank you for having me, and I look forward to talking to you. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm Stephanie Delia. Um, I am the managing attorney for the Human Citizenship Now that um, I was just introduced. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, just a little bit more. Um, I too uh, from, I come from an immigration family um, or an immigrant family. I myself am an immigrant. I was born in Haiti in 1980, and I came here in 1987. My family came a little bit earlier. They bought a house here. Um, they brought myself and my siblings, five of us total. My mother was a nurse. Um, my father, who was an engineer in Haiti, came here and became a uh, janitor. He worked at um, an asylum hospital <laughs> uh, as a janitor and then went to school. So he was going to school and working full time, which means we saw him for about three hours a day, uh -huh. during which time he slept because he couldn't be bothered. So he's definitely bothered, but he needs to get his rest so that he could get up and work nights. And so for, let's say, between seven years old when I came here and about maybe 11-ish, um, early junior high, I barely saw my dad, even though he was working, I mean, he was basically living in the house, but it was five of us children. My mother was working practically 12 hours a uh, day. My father was going to school full time and working full time. Funny story, when I went to law school for a year in, I started expressing how stressed I was and how to handle it. He definitely reminded me of what he himself has to do. <laughs> And he's an engineer, I'm my dad. <laughs> so he was like, nobody's going to hear your tears, no one feels sorry for you, yet. get it done, you won't have children, and you don't have a full-time job while you do this. So um, I say this all to say, <laughs> I now understand on a different level exactly what he was going through at the time. I'm going to add a little bit more. I came in 1987. Most of you don't know this, I'm a little bit older. Right around the 80s, there was this whole talk about um, Haitians bringing HIV into the country. At the same time, I couldn't speak English, so I had a very strong accent, so I had to deal with that. My family's sense of fashion was a little bit different from that of America. And so they believed in the big clothes, they believed in the bright colors, they believed shoes had to be worn, and they didn't like me wearing the jeans to school because I was a girl. So you can picture big yellow clothes, pinky hair, um, skirts, shiny shoes, elementary school, patients have HIV, big accent, had a breath in elementary school. Um, and despite all of that, I still had to deal with, you know, being, you know, translated for my parents. And even though my parents were going through all that, even though my father went from being an engineer in Haiti and having a really good job to being a janitor here um, and working all day and going to school and struggling and barely having time to deal with his families. He was still very proud and thought of it as a privilege to live in this country and to even have the opportunity to pursue this. My mother was working 12 hours and she was a nurse in and came here and she actually started doing the play, um, was also very proud because she thought it was a great opportunity to support her family. She strongly believed that in working as hard as she did, she would give us an opportunity to pursue our dreams and our goals and become um, great contributors to the country. So we come, you know, 
her and my father are working that hard so that we could pay the mortgage, so that we could put us all five through school. And taking a back seat to us and changing the direction of life, right? Because they were both doing quite well in Haiti. I came here and basically started, you know, doing jobs that may not have had as much prestige um, and maintaining that pride and encouraging us to be proud of who we are and considering ourselves not just lucky but privileged, right? My parents put that, you know, constantly told us that nothing is guaranteed and nothing, you're not entitled to anything, right? You don't come into this earth. You shouldn't come here expecting anything. If you want it, you got to pursue it. you got to work hard for it. And if a student says, Haitian creation, go back to your own nation, which I still remember. I was told to wear the laces at Sabbath. I can't believe I still remember that. But when you're told that and you go home crying, you know, my father would say, look, this is your nation, your nation now. And this family, we work hard. We struggle, we overcome, and we survive, and we succeed. That's just what we do. And it doesn't have to be easy, but you succeed anyway. So yes, your heart is broken, I get it, I love you, you're amazing, being Haitian is something to be proud of, you know, go ahead and feel bad for a few minutes, but when you're done, get the homework done, do well, get back in school the next day, um, and then, you know, we'll go to Ponderosa this weekend, we'll have a family meal, <laughs> and we'll get over it. <coughs> Bottom line was, throughout the difficulties, it was a very constant thing I was told on a regular basis, just because it's hard doesn't mean that you give up just because it's hard doesn't mean that you have an excuse, right? So you get through it when it gets hard, you look forward to the days that it's easy. We're gonna go to Florida for the summer for a few weeks and everybody's gonna be laid back and we'll be in the future for a few weeks. We'll be really living the dream <laughs> before we come back into the hustle and bustle. So I say that to say my, my truth, my knowledge, my experience about the immigration experience is one of hope, it's one of hard work, it's one of survival, it's one of success. You know, my father, another thing. So now he works for MTA, and he is um, an engineer in um, the MTA, and he's a manager. And he still tells me all the time that, um, he was an electrical engineer, so he, he went from being an electrical engineer in Haiti to being a janitor, um, to becoming an electrician, to then actually becoming an electrical engineer. And so he tells me all the time that there's nothing that's more fun than talking to the guy who's just getting in, who's like just, you know, not just the electrician, but who's the electrician, and really doing the work with them and seeing their faces when they turn over and they realize their manager actually cares, right? Actually wants to show them how to do it well, and actually tells them the story about how he himself climbed all the way up from the very lowest to the highest rock. And one of the things he says all the time is that he doesn't see it as often, right? So he tells me his colleagues see themselves as better than those that work for them very often. And they don't identify with them. And he knows the reason he identifies is because when he came into this country, he just wasn't given a red carpet, right? He wasn't given an opportunity to go straight up. He had to work every step of the way. And along the way, it was those that treated him with respect despite the way he was viewed by all his colleagues, that he remembers the most. I say that to say, I think we're in a time in our country where not enough people identify with the common thread of what it is to be a person, right? What it is to have struggle. And those common threads are, are similar amongst us all, right? Whether you're immigrated, well, we're a country of immigrants, so everybody's family immigrated from somewhere. Anybody who studies history knows that. <laughs> so unless you're Native American, which is the only exception to the rule, you come from a family of immigrants. But I think no matter where you immigrated from, very few people immigrated here to come fail, right? I don't think anybody says, or any grandparent said, I'm gonna you know, go across the waters, I'm gonna cross the border, and I'm gonna come into America, and struggle, right? Everybody came here wanting something better, wanting a family, wanting hope, wanting life, wanting survival, wanting success. And so, if you acknowledge that, then you have to also acknowledge that where we are today has moved so far away from us understanding the common thread is that we all come here to survive. Wanting to push these people out, wanting to get rid of immigrants, 
wanting to deport people and break up families goes against everything that is, in fact, American. And although we're being told a different narrative, as an immigration attorney, I come into contact with people every single day um, that come in front of me, and they're terrified and depressed and stressed. And one of the things that I try to remember on a very regular basis is that the very first thing, the very, the very, the very beginning of my conversations with my typical client is number one, you deserve to be here. Number two, you belong here. Number three, and this is the most important part, your immigration status has absolutely no impact on who you are. Right? So I'm looking at you as a client, as a people, as a person who's going through some tough times, but it's my job to help you get through it and to give you um, the legal support that you need. The rest has to come from you. Most of my clients come to me having, having heard such negative narratives along the way that by the time they get to me, I think they forget that most of the immigrant clients I meet are some of the strongest people I meet. They are most of these, but they're some of the most inspiring people. Um, I've met DACA recipients who were um, straight students, who were army students, who were also maintaining part-time jobs, who made me look like a slacker <laughs> um, on a regular basis. I meet parents who are coming and saying, hey, I want a petition for my child, and I'm working, making minimum wage, and I'm going to pay this $3,000 for this application. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, how did you save this? Like, you know, I can barely see that. Right? I meet these people that, you know, you look at their income, then you look at what they pull off with it, and it's, it baffles me every time. And then I'm reminded that my parents, too, you know, created miracles, and I still don't understand how they pulled it off. I still don't understand how they accomplished all that they did, but I know it can be done because I'm a product of it. So, although I'm an immigration attorney, and what I do is assist people in submitting um, applications, and I fight with USCIS, and you know, I, I find these forms and I go to court. I have found that within the last few years that more than an immigration attorney, I have gone back to being that 10-year-old girl whose parents are working their hives off. And then I go out into school and I go into the world and people are telling me, oh, your parents, you know, are Haitians and people are Haitians into this country and they're booty scratchers. And I, you know, back then I was like, no, my dad is one of the coolest dads ever. And Granted, he's usually annoyed with me for waking him up before his nap, but still, <laughs> he has every right to be tired, you know, and my mom gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning to cook a meal before she goes to work 12 hours so that when we come back from school, we have something to eat, and quite frankly, I don't have to eat McDonald's. So, you know, I remember me even then knowing that what I was being told about my immigrant family was false. I remember then being told you know, and they were like, oh, you know, you know, I can't even speak English well. And I'm like, well, he's smarter than you, right? And so all of that comes out when I speak to my clients on a regular basis. And I, I'm grateful that I had that experience because I realize now that that's the reason that I love what I do so much because I think my clients need to see me, right? They need to see the person who knows that they're not a burden. They're not criminals. They're not disrupting the country. They are, in fact, the very thing that makes this country extraordinary um, and the reason that this country is extraordinary. And I know that well. I know it because uh, I'm a product of it. And ultimately, when I get applications approved, 90% of my clients come back and they're like, oh my God, thank you so much. And you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I always knew we were going to get approved. And they're like, not for that. But it's for the respect you treated me with. It's, it's for hearing me. It's for listening to me. It's for treating me as an equal. It's for all the other stuff that I do on a regular basis in addition to submitting the application forms. So bottom line, I come here as a Haitian immigrant myself. I'm just a Haitian immigrant attorney, immigration attorney. Um, and that's kind of how I started my day since the day Trump won. Um, I made a, a, a switch. I decided rather than continuing to be an attorney, to get interesting cases, to um, try to build up, I guess, my reputation in the immigration field, that I was going to be the person that every single client I came into contact with would know that I know, that all of the stuff that I'm hearing, all of the noise, I know it's not true. Um, it is crucial that I continue to do that on a regular basis, and I'm beyond blessed that my boss allows me to. <laughs> um, CUNY Citizenship now is incredibly supportive. Um, I take way longer 
with my consultations that I should, and they let me get away with it. They actually promoted me, which shocks me a little because I broke most of the rules. Um, you know, I sign. You know, I sign up for cases where I represent clients that we're not supposed to. Um, and on a regular basis, the deputy directors like staff. We can't do another G28. But okay, right? I'm seeing clients at 8 a.m. when we open at 9. I stay till 7. And every single time, it's like, staff, we can't do that. But I get it. You know, I'm going to churches on Saturdays and speaking about immigration. And, you know, they end up getting 20 clients to walk through the door. And of course, I get the call, like, did you go speak someplace again? And I'm like, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, I say all of that to say, you know, they don't, they all, they're all very supportive, um, and they all give me the freedom to do these things, and I don't know if I could be me if I was given the privilege to, so I'm grateful that I had parents who reminded me that just because things are hard doesn't mean that you stop, and more importantly, that we're great because we're immigrants, and not despite it, right? I'll be here for questions and answers. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ibu Stantika. Thank you all for being here. And um, I'm very pleased to be on this panel with uh, Carolina, Tamara, and Stephanie. Um, I'll tell, also tell a little bit of my story. My, I was born in Haiti, and my parents, my mom, uh, my dad came to Brooklyn first, East Flatbush, um, when I was two, and then my Mom, when I was four, and I grew up with my aunt and uncle who uh, looked after me. And so, when and when I was twelve, after eight years of separation, my parents um, sent for me, and I moved to New York. I lived on Westbury Court, which is uh, near Ocean Avenue. The train goes right went right under the building, uh, the D train, uh, where where we lived. And I and then I went to Jackie Robinson. I told I was there yesterday. And I told them the story that I came on March 21st, I, this is kind of my anniversary week, on a Friday, and then on Monday I was at, at that school, um, confused, perplexed, had no idea what was going on, I didn't speak any English, and um, just as um, Stephanie said, the kids were very mean, of, like to kids who were Haitian, because they would call you, you know, like Frenchy, they would say you have HBO, Haitian body odor, there was all kinds of... Um, beatings and things um, going on, and so at that, and then getting used to your parents, of course, was was uh, something uh, that took time because I had been eight years without without my parents. My dad was a, a cab driver, what they then called a gypsy cab driver, and what I tell people now is called Uber, and um, and he would just you know pick pick up people. Um, and then my mom worked in a factory making um, handbags. And so all of these, I think it's important that you heard all these uh, personal narratives because personal narratives are important. And personal narratives are what is really missing from the scapegoating of immigrants because we're all linked into a group of negative narrative narratives of, which is really contradictory because of immigrants are supposed to be both lazy and taking away people's jobs at the same time, right? They're taking away all our jobs, but they're lazy. They're leaving up social worker. How are those things possible um, all at once? And another, my other immigration story is that my uncle who raised me in Haiti um, died in immigration custody at 81 years old. In 2004, there was some trouble in Haiti, and my uncle had been coming here to Brooklyn uh, for 30 years, he had a valid visa, but when he showed up in uh, Miami, they asked him how long he would be staying. He said, well, because there was this trouble, he didn't know how long, so he asked for asylum. He could have just entered um, without saying anything, but he asked for asylum. At 81 years old, he was a cancer survivor who spoke with a voice box. He was taken into custody. He was detained. His medication was taken away, and he died five days um, in immigration custody tied to a bed in an immigration ward in um, uh, the prison ward of, an, of a hospital in Miami. So these stories are important to know because I think often when people talk about immigrants, they, they don't know the sacrifices that have been made for the success stories that you, you see here. Not that I think people have to be exceptional to be considered um, important because the whole immigration policy of this country is supposed to be built on you know what's written on the Statue of Liberty, give me your downtrodden and, and so forth. 
and which is something that's very that's changing um, so rapidly in, in, in these very uh, perilous times that, that we are in. So the current immigration status, both the way it's spoken about and then the way it's, it's put into policy, makes these stories, you know, these uh, success stories that you're seeing less possible um, for many. And I too, like, uh, like Tamara, remember being my parents' advocates and, you know, at the factory my, where my mom worked or at a doctor's offices. And when you're an immigrant child who's kind of a translator, interpreter, you become so privy to your parents' financial information, to their medical information, things that they might have wanted to keep secret from you, but because you're, you're the interpreter, you're, you really grow up much faster and you really start seeing your parents' vulnerability in a different way because you are now the, you're like the interpreter of their, their secrets. And in that way, two narratives are important because I was able to know what my parents' struggles were very, very uh, early on. And I think, you know, when, when, when Tamara is talking about her Rhodes Scholarship, for example, you know, you could imagine all the, the sacrifices that that meant for her parents. It's like we really stand on the shoulders of this generation that came on early. And I think of how many other Rhodes Scholars we could have in this group of kids who are, who are TPS or DACA recipients who are now in limbo, and, and how many of these opportunities are being uh, taken away from them. So the politics of, you know, the title of the panel is The Politics of Immigration. What I see as the politics of immigration is also the personalization of immigration, and that we have to realize that these politics, like the, even when things are uttered, like when the president made these remarks, you know, about Nigeria, about Haiti, about the kind of, you know, country he thinks that these places are, that these things have consequences. He doesn't just say, he didn't, he didn't just say, you know, like, say, you know, Haitians have AIDS or that Haiti is this kind of country, but that was followed by TPS being canceled, that was followed by HB1 and HB2 visas being taken away from people from Haiti. So these things have uh, consequences that really affect the daily lives of, of people. And recently, um, ICE removed from its website the, this saying that's been there forever, that we're a nation of immigrants. And, and that's not something we should take lightly because it, the, the, even the way the country is seeing itself in terms of immigration is being redefined and that the politics of that is that what made, this, what made so many stories possible for people in, in this country are being removed and it's being acknowledged by this removal of this saying that this is a country of immigrants. This country, uh, we, we've been put on notice, does not consider itself a country of immigrants anymore, and um, even language also, this language of chain migration, which to me also always sounds of the uh, slavery, the history of chains, and uh, it seems to be merging these two things. So the politics are not, are not light, and they have very important consequences. Not only do they make stories like ours less possible, but they also lead to more family separations and more suffering for a, a whole lot of, a whole new generation of immigrants. Thank you. Great, so um, we're gonna open it up for a discussion. Um, so, uh, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask or a comment they would like to make? so much for sharing. I just want to say you really touched me and you had me thinking about my own family and you really put a lot of things into perspective because as a first generation American, we are privileged and it's really hard to see everything that your parents have done for you and it's hard, um, sometimes it builds resentment and it's hard to look at it from their point of view so you really kind of when you see that. Thank you. Um, so I'm Mexican. My son is half Mexican and Dominican. Um, you know, we um, and I hear now what's going on with the Dominican Republic and Haiti. How frustrated are you? The fact that they're trying to keep you all from from you know it's your country and from here. How frustrated? Are you guys frustrated? How do you feel about that? I'm not 
Well, I mean, I, I am pained, like, I'm, I'm pained at not just the Dominican situation, but the situation in Brazil, the situation in the Bahamas, the situation in Chile. So I'm, I'm very pained that as a people we're in that situation wherever we go, right? And that the consequences in country have led us to be kind of like this, these types of migrants around the world that, so it's, my frustration is often at the source, like at, at the kind of leadership we've had and that, that young people feel like they have so few opportunities that now Chile, for example, is a big migration place and then you're gonna start to have people being returned from Chile because the last few years that's where people have been going um, in very large numbers. So it, it pains me more. And of course we advocate for people like the Dominican situation is, has its own unique thing because the, the people, a lot of people in the Dominican Republic who are being turned back were actually Dominicans of Haitian descent. And there's a particular specific policy towards them. And just as we were, you know, we, you speak out against the TPS here and, and the injustices of that. So I think in the Dominican situation too, there's that specificity where people who were born there, who had been there for generations, and then this law came and they became stateless. So we have to speak to the specificity of each situation, but in general, I'm just pained that we find ourselves globally in that, in that situation overall. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, um, I want to add, so, it, it does break my heart, but it's also very weird because in America, I have many friends who are Dominicans, and, you know, we get along and we click and we share the same foods and spices, I mean, yeah. we practically yeah. are one, right? And so, to sit with my Dominican friend and, you know, talk about running for office and being the Española for, um, mm -hmm. You know, and taking over Brooklyn, <laughs> um, and then reading the papers, what is happening? It, you know, it, it's sad because you understand. You know, you wrote about it in the papers. We wrote about the river, um, and I don't know if you wrote the forming of the boats. Um, and historically, we know the story. You know, we know about um, the um, We know that it leads back to a long turn history of the conflict between the two countries that resulted from really imperialism, so it really was never about the country itself, right? The people of the country for both sides were victims, both of them were getting right. Um, and consequently, instead of getting together and fighting imperialism, they started fighting amongst each other, which was always the intent. Um, and so we see the results of it continuing. And as a Haitian person and being with my Dominican friends who were like, you should go to the Dominican Republic and hang out. And I'm like, I'm conflicted because as a Haitian person investing in the country that I know has policies, that has real issues, that is causing my people harm, which are also, you know, like she said, these are actual Dominicans of Haitian descent. And so it's so complicated and so interwoven. Um, but I do think there's a difference between being a Haitian person here and being in Haiti, and perhaps or being in the Dominican Republic. Do you guys agree? That the politics, I think, affects us differently depending on where you are, because you're looking at it as this horrible thing, and you're affected by it. But you're also interacting with people who agree with you, that I don't know how much of it is happening in the Dominican Republic, right? I don't know how, how many allies Dominicans of Haitian descent in the Dominican Republic have. And I haven't been back since, yeah. you know. So. There are many. There are many. Okay. So that's at least positive. Mm -hmm. I mean, similar to your story, I, I mean, especially in high school, I had a lot of Dominican friends, and we call each other like islands of so like there's no yeah. like, contention. Like, exactly. Immigrants on this side. I remember when I heard about the issue, I was in the car with my dad, and the Haitian was on my side, and we were in New York. So, like, <laughs> We were getting the news. <laughs> we were getting the news through the radio, and I was asking him to explain the story to me, and he was explaining, it, and I just didn't understand. <laughs> so I was like, "What do you? Like, we're the same people." I didn't understand the issue. I didn't understand the contention. But I think, at least on a personal perspective, what was good about that is that it forced me to kind of go back and study how Haiti and the Dominican Republic were colonized differently, mm -hmm. and how that is still impacting 
the tensions that are, are, I guess, bubbling up today about, you know, if you trace back that history, you can see why, the, you know, Haiti doesn't have the same amount of resources agriculturally and economically that the American Republic has. And I think what's sad for me is seeing how a lot of times with, I mean, even in America with our history of civil rights or our history of colonization, we tend to push that so far back in history and act as if it doesn't have an effect. But I think that's a very clear um, example of how that still just has an impact on how we treat each other when we're the same people. Uh, I, will, I, I will uh give you like a complimentary response. They are, because my Spanish was better than my English, I will answer mm -hmm. you in Spanish and go so Rafa with Munoz is translated for me. Uh, so I am director fundador del Instituto de Estudios Haitianos mm -hmm. at the end of the college. So since the institute started here, we've been focused on um, consciousness raising. El tema de las relaciones haitiano dominicanas es un tema bastante complejo. The uh, relationship between uh, Haitians and Dominicans is, is, is a, a topic that's very complex. Y para ello, para tener un entendimiento complejo, tenemos que hacer un análisis involucrando muchos factores. And to have a complex understanding and a complex, we must have an, an analysis that brings in many different variables. La primera cosa me, que me gustaría puntualizar es que no todos los dominicanos están en una relación de conflicto con los haitianos. The first thing that I want to point out is that not all Dominicans are in a conflictual relationship with Haiti or Haitians. Desde un punto de vista sociológico hay que entender las relaciones de Haití y República Dominicana desde el tema del proceso de construcción de la nación dominicana. So, um, in order to better understand these dynamics, the relationship between Haitians and Dominicans, we have to, um, from a sociological point, understand the nation state uh, or nation building of the Dominican Republic. Porque Haití ocupó la República Dominicana durante 22 años. Because Haiti occupied the Dominican Republic for 22 years. So, entonces, hay muchas élites porque cualquier tipo de nación es el proyecto de creación de una élite. So, uh, nation building is a, a process of elite formation. Yeah. Entonces, siempre hay una reproducción, una parte, no todas las élites dominicanas, pero una parte de la élite dominicana se ha encargado de promover una ideología bueno, basada en el anti-haitianismo. So part of, um, some of the elites in the Dominican Republic have, have um, uh, staked their reputations on um, creating these kind of anti-Haitian biases. Sí, entonces hoy en día, por ejemplo, hace poco, yo estuve en la celebración de Dominican de eh, Celebration en el New York City County y todavía hay élites que siguen haciendo lo mismo. And so recently I was in the celebration of uh, the Dominican Republic in the New York City Council and there are some elites that continue to promote these biases. Sí, pero también como haitiano y como instituto de estudios haitianos nosotros tenemos que ser muy objetivo. Mm -hmm. But as someone from Haiti and as a director of the Haitian Studies Institute um, I, I have to be very objective. El, el día, en el momento que en Haiti tenemos élites capaces y élites capaces de entender que hay que trabajar para el Estado haitiano y en el momento en que tenemos élites, en el momento que Haiti tenga un nivel de desarrollo económico más o menos similar a la República Dominicana, muchas tensiones entre Haiti y República Dominicana se van a matizar. So the day that um, the elites in Haiti uh, 
Uh, where there's more development, where there's more money, where, where, where we kind of rise to the level of, de of development that the Dominican Republic has, a lot of these tensions will kind of be neutralized. Yeah, and I will just conclude by saying now I'm working with many people, Haitian, uh, American, Dominican, American. I am very, I have a close relationship with Ramon Hernandez, the director of the Dominican Studies, because we do need to address by you know, that kind of panel discussion, yeah. that, you know, objectively, because Haiti needs the Dominican Republic and the Dominican Republic as well needs yeah. Haiti. So, but it's very complex issue and we are here for uh, learning and doing research and to have a better understanding between both state nations. Because as Jean-Marie Théodat said, we are one island and two nations. So Haiti and the Dominican Republic, they need to move forward together. Thank you. Although I'm an immigrant myself, I'm an adjunct instructor in the English department and I teach a general ed course that's specifically for immigrant literature and a lot of my students are first generation Americans. So oftentimes I get feedback asking, why do I assign these immigrant narratives that I can't connect to, right? So what can we do to, to like what advice do you guys have for first generation Americans who cannot establish that connection with the immigrant community? What can we do to, to not we, we as in first generation Americans, do to assist immigrant community? So we're talking about, like I, in my time, they would consider me half generation, mm -hmm. like who came as a child. Yeah. And then, so when you're saying, so you're saying, the immigrant students who are having trouble connecting the, or the first generation, the first born, generation here, born here with immigrant parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or not even like they just have like far uh, immigration rounds Oh, so they, and they're not connecting with the immigrant narratives you're choosing? Yeah. Like House on Mango Street, not working <laughs> for them? Just, yeah, or Brown or Brownstone. <laughs> Oh. They're just like, why, why are we so interested? So in are you getting time? maybe closer to this current time? Like, yeah, like Juno Diaz, yeah, yeah. Louis Alvarez? I mean, I'm sure it's not about the Garcia sisters. <laughs> 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 I guess, I don't know why they're frustrated. I'm sure it's about our interests and in, in the immigrant experience when it's so obvious that we need to have this conversation. I mean, it's obvious for me as an immigrant. I just don't know how to get them engaged. Well, maybe you should go tell them to go out and get a book. Mm -hmm like them so like everybody in the class pick one or something that they might want to read and yeah. see what they come back with but there's a gentleman who might have a suggestion for you um, that's my former student <laughs> uh, okay they're perfect <laughs> no um i think the issue with you that the students you're having um is the fact that we're still we're still our first generation the problem is is that um they grew up in a time where it's all about me 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 mm -hmm. and not in time of understanding family like, a lot of people in first generation have problems with families. Like, let's say the mother talks Spanish all the time and argues with them, but like, they don't understand the issue she's trying to point out. Yeah. Um, it, I, don't, I don't see a way, currently a way, to like, help them understand, but I think the best thing to do is let them talk to their parents, but avoid arguing, but that's tough. <laughs> you know, that's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. You might have another suggestion. Oh, well, I just want to say, once again, thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much we'll for your presentation. <laughs> I wanted to laugh when um, you two presented because my mom is a, in, in a healthcare field. She's a nurse assistant, and then my dad is definitely in, um, a janitor. So it was just like so hilarious to me that like, I feel like we, those patterns are our form, but being in her class, I kind of learned that it's because that's, that's what they, they've learned. When their first instinct when they come here, when they migrate here, is that it's survival. And that's what they, they're they learning, and that's what they, their American dream is to adapt to that. So that's the first thing that they they, um, they know. And I always get kind of like, I feel a little bit bad because I got a little bit frustrated with my parents. I like, Dad, why don't you um, try to go into another field? But this is what they know, you know? And also, as a first-generation migrant, I actually in, um, immigrate, or descendant of here, yes. I actually love the pieces that you choose for the class because 
I feel like I'm, I was so far removed from my culture. Like I used to get frustrated having to answer the calls and translate. My grandmother doesn't speak English at all. So I had to kind of like learn. I felt like it was forced. And I felt like I ignored everything from like the insults and the fighting. My, sis, my siblings were all in um, bilingual classes and I felt kind of like an, an outcast because I feel like my mom and my parents didn't put me in a, in a bilingual class. I felt like kind of like stripped of my roots for a very long time, probably until maybe a few years ago where I was like, I really want to get dig deeper into my roots and I traveled to Haiti for the first time last May and I, it was just definitely like a culture shock and an eye opener that I really don't want to be so far removed, but instead I want to identify with my parents and their experiences and, and their sacrifices um, that have paved the way for my successes today. So I thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have, so can I just respond? I think those jobs that you mentioned, probably their parents and so many others ended up in them because they were the most available, mm -hmm. the most accessible. So that's why you also have a lot of people in elder care who take care of older people. There was an article in the Times recently about how when TPS ends, like a lot of people will leave their elderly care. But your, she brings out a very interesting element of the immigration experience that work out in a lot of families and maybe in some of your families. You have the U.S. born children, like my, I have two brothers who are U.S. born and then two of us who came from Haiti. And sometimes that makes a very interesting dynamic in the family because I know people who are older now and they're like, you know, the, the U.S. born children, the first generation children were like the Tia American, the little <laughs> Americans. And then sometimes they felt like they were treated better. And it's interesting, your story is the first time that I heard like the Tia American <laughs> saying that she felt left out. Because it's usually like the American born child is like, it's usually the child who brought us here too. And that, because there's a time where if you had a, you know, someone that was the way for the parent, the family to, to legalize their status. So the Tia American, the little American child is like the prince or princess. <laughs> of the family. So that's a very interesting dynamic that's not written about or talked about much either. And my entire family calls me the Tia Megan. Like, <laughs> my, my older sister, I'm the youngest of three, so my older sister was born in Haiti and uh, my brother and I were born here. And I mean, you, you see the tensions in like all the little things in the house, like my sister's accent is perfect and my brother and I, like we speak her out, but like we speak with an American mm -hmm. accent, so it's like kind of trash and it's just it's really like, um, you just see all these little contentions, and I know that, especially growing up here and going through the immigrant, uh, the education system the way I did, um, the way that especially Haitian women I see like filter into the healthcare field. I mean, they do it the way that a lot of people do it. It's just our network. It's what we know. Um, so I remember when my aunts came to America for the first time. They immediately, like my parents, started getting talks about they need to start these classes to be a home attendant to go into elderly care. And I said something like, is that what they're interested in? Is that what they want to do? And they were just like, that's, that's, that's not an issue. <laughs> that's, not, that's not important. That's just like, to your point, it's our survival skills. It's like the steps that we take yeah. to get a footing here. And I think being the, the TMA, again, like I don't, I don't, I understand the narrative because I've seen it, but I also um, understand that I have a privilege that they don't have, that I get to like explore things in a way that they, that they don't. I get to go through my education in a way that they don't. So it does create like these tensions between the family that are not bad things, they're just like little nuances and that everything. There's a hand, yeah. Yeah, I have to ask, uh, you know, you're talking about the students and not the students. Is there any way that we as students can help them? So, I mean, from a legal perspective, unfortunately, well, let me not say unfortunately, I think advocacy is crucial. And I think one of the things I find with a lot of the DACA students that I speak to is some of them actually don't even want to disclose their status because they're embarrassed. Um, they're concerned that when it ends, everybody's going to know that they're undocumented and those who may not like them will take advantage of it. Um, there's also a lot of the, a lot of DACA students work to help support their family members. And a lot of their, the other students in the school are not aware of just how much pressure are on these students. Um, so I think one of the best ways to support them is potentially to not treat them necessarily as just DACA students, but kind of invite them in and unite with them, right? So you could be like, okay, we're advocating for you as a student. 
Um, I recently was interviewed um, by John Jay, and I remembered the person speaking to me was asking me what is special about the doctors, right? What makes them different? What do you find that is the, union, <clears throat> the common thread? And what I ended up with was their are and they are very poor. They are no different from any kind of students. I have found the ones who procrastinate to the ones who work the hardest. I have found the ones who don't want a job, they just want the card. The ones who want to go clubbing, the ones who only care about their looks, the ones who care about grades, the ones who are A-type students, the one who's supporting the family, the one whose parents tell them just be young. I mean, there is literally no difference between a DACA student and a non-DACA student other than that immigration status. So I think if the whole community, the whole school community, all of Brooklyn College started to identify as students and saying, you DACA students, we're gonna remove the word DACA, we're, we're advocating for you as one of us, right? You are our sister, our brother in every way. We're chained together and if you go, we go. I think we'll make a powerful statement. I think if we stopped saying DACA students and other students and started saying we as a whole are students, right? You can't take my, my classmate away, right? Because Aside from DACA, this is my classmate, this is my friend, this is the person I grew up with, this is the person who's been here since they were two. Um, I think it would be powerful. And I think right now, that's the fear that I see. And most of it is coming from the DACA students themselves who are really afraid. But I think the fear comes from them not necessarily believing they'll be access accepted wholly if they disclose that. So in my experience, that has been it. And just for the record, I think right before Trump was announced, um, CUNY Citizenship Now, um, I started this project where we started to try to get as many DACA students who entered unlawfully to travel and come back so they could fix, fix their status. Um, at the time, I was eight months pregnant, which was not wise because I didn't realize that I was going to have the baby early. Nor did I realize the impact, how stressful Trump's presidency would have been. Mm -hmm. So I started, I took it on, and we were gonna like get all these 30 students to travel and come back two days before he takes office. Um, and to the extent that we were successful, whatever he did would be irrelevant because they would have adjusted how they entered and then they'd be able to get a green card in the country. I say this to say if you enter the country unlawfully, the law as it is written requires that you go back to your home country for the interview. Um, for a lot of DACA students, if they were to do that, they would get stuck in their home country for at least 10 years and not be able to return. It's a complicated yeah. kind of law, but in essence, you have, the, you have it in a nutshell. At the time, I remembered, and I mean, I had 30 applications, so I, in a matter of three weeks, 30 kids came through and I thought it was gonna be like 10, so I ended up having to do a lot more applications. And I remembered one day, five in a row, I asked students, how did you come into the country? And every single one was like, I don't know, I was one. I don't know, I was two. I don't know. I, and, but it became like, at, by the end of the first day, I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> you, you know, you were really, like you've been here for as long as it could, you, you could remember life itself. Um, I say that example to say, change my perspective, right? I realized at that moment, I was like, if you came here at one, really, you're as American as American can be. It's just a piece of paper that makes you an other. Um, so I think if the school as a community eliminated that differentiation and say DACA or not, you're just a student, and as a student population, we stand as one, it would speak volumes. I would also add that um, there is a tremendous focus on DACA right now, but there are, on this campus, 300 undocumented students who are not DACA students. They don't even have DACA. Like, so, and they become invisible in this conversation about dreamers, right? And I think it's really important to not just focus on dreamers and not just focus on DACA, but there are a whole lot of people who for a million reasons are not DACA eligible. Um, and they're even in more, you know, in a, in a more vulnerable <laughs> position. Yeah. True. I just wanted to add on the question you said um, about in, um, informing kids. Well, okay, so, you know, you're teaching you for your kids that are like tw in their 20s, so they're, they're, they're in their self selfish years. Um, <laughs> so I think um, you need to learn from them um, in the sense where, you know, um, understand their first world problems, right? And compare it to, you know, what's going on now. Um, and just keep informing because um, although they're not going to, they might not want to connect, but just inform, inform, inform because there's going to be something that they're going to be like, wait, you know, I couldn't find those pairs of shoes last week. Now I know how that, you know, how that feels, you know? Um, so that's just, I mean, yeah. Well, let me stand up and say, well, thank you. Um, 
this is a conversation that we've been having since 1975. I guess I just did it myself in the room. <laughs> I'm older than practically everybody in here, right? Um, yes, I think so. I'm looking at your eyes, sir. But, but anyway, I'm glad that you're older. But just thank you for actually sharing this, this narrative with us. And I want to say something just a little further. The people whom you are struggling with or struggling for or advocating for get to know them a little better, right? I taught a, a nonprofit out of Mega Evans College for 20 years. And I taught particularly children from the Northern Africa, Haiti primarily, but French speaking Caribbean. And one of the first things that we find in order to connect, right, we have to empower them. And if you know the history and the legacy of the people whom you are teaching, you're gonna connect easier. So for instance, with the Haitian population, it was so easy to connect, right? It was a simple task of Hey, when were you born? You go out there and find two or three major events that happened in your special birthday from the country that you're from, right? Because what we found is that they did not know their own history, right? So what's the point of trying to connect with something? So I think this panel is phenomenal. I mean, I'm looking at all of you, including Adrian Dantikad, you're all so young. It's like, it's amazing, <laughs> right? And you're speaking so, such a powerful message. Right, and that message is to get out there. So, I mean, thank you for the Department of Haitian Studies to actually do that together. I don't know if you're the head of the the Dominican Studies Department. I, I think, well, <laughs> but it, I mean, this is this is fabulous. This is a dialogue that we need to have with other students. Okay, and it doesn't matter where in the globe that you're from. This is a melting pot, and we have to take ownership of that. And so, those who are making trips back home and those things, I encourage you to do that. Continue to go home. But this dialogue, I wish you all the best, and I wish you can actually continue to do that. And I think we need to get more of the community involved. And in the future, let me know. I get more Mega Evans College people here mm -hmm. to participate. And again, just, just want to say thank you. Marvelous. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think my question kind of embodies what I mean, everyone's question concerns are during this discussion. Plainly put is how do we uh, add and build on the narrative of immigration. Just by summing up what I've heard in my interpretation is that we need to empower, educate, and evolve. So do you ladies or anyone else that's here have anything to add as far as the components we can add as a society and as individuals to help build, build the narrative when it comes to immigration? And equalize my I love how everybody's claiming they're students. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must mean you guys are great students. <laughs> I think one of the ways I would suggest is to build coalitions, right? To see where our different struggles meet. So one of the encouraging things that I've seen, say in Florida, is that you had, because before, it used to be like, okay, immigration is your issue, Black Lives Matter is your issue, the gun thing is your issue. And then so you've seen like, uh, at least in the community where I am, like around TPS, for example, suddenly because people who are getting, who are from Nicaragua, who are, get, who are also on TPS, realize that if Haitian TPS goes, it's very likely that Salvadoran TPS will go. And so you would go to these demonstrations and everybody was there. Before it used to be like Haitians fighting for their own TPS. So you started getting coalition building. And then you started having dreamers with the dream defenders who, you know, who were also uh, advocating against police violence. And, and so I think, I think one way is coalition building. And then as, um, as you were saying, I think to realize that these issues affect us all. And, and to continue to point these things out that, you know, and maybe people, even if they're acting on their own self-interest, the fact that they realize that deporting people who take care of their elderly will hurt their elderly, maybe that will be their motivation, but to point also out these ways that we contribute and in very concrete ways um, that maybe they don't care about the humanity of the situation, but they'll care about, you know, how it affects them. But definitely, I think the coalition building and finding all these ways that the, this, our issues connect with other people's issues, because I think together we're a lot stronger than, than advocating alone. Um, I think especially as uh, college students, um, 
we're in a good space to capitalize on the resources that we have, um, that we often take for granted, even if that's just a space to gather and have these conversations or using our college's resources to um, advocate and um, provide opportunities for our students who are going through these struggles. So I know specifically at Hunter we've had the school, or I don't think it was, the administration, it does a good job of working with us, so it's not like we have to force them, but it was students who took the lead in asking our school to bring in lawyers and post workshops about how to do your doctor or something like that. Or bring in lawyers to just talk about you know, knowing your rights, knowing your steps through the process. Um, a lot of people, because of money or other financial issues, don't often have access to that information because they don't have access to lawyers or things like that. So to the extent that you can get your school and their money and their resources to do that for students, I think that's great. Um, also, because we are all here together and we have the numbers here in a college campus, it's relatively, I don't say it's easy, but it's um, easier than it would be to um, bring in like representatives, bring in senators, bring in your congress. Um, people to um, advocate these issues directly to them. So again, we brought in uh, Senator Dick Durbin, who's the in the Senate, and he's the I think head writer of the Dream Act in the Senate. Um, and it was really powerful to have him sit there and have doctor students who are from our school tell him like, oh, I have you know 375 days left. Um, what are you doing to make sure that I'm not? graduating with no potential to use my degree because I don't have the right um, legal status. So I think to the extent that we can use like, like our college buildings and our college resources as a tool to advocate for, for our fellow students who are going through struggles, we should do that. And just to build on that, which I think that's probably one of the most I think we underestimate how, power, um, how powerful college campuses are individually, but also remember that you're part of a CUNY system, and CUNY itself is really massive. And so, um, and we know that DACA students um, are in every CUNY campus, as well as undocumented students. Um, so I, with Citizenship Now, for instance, um, the program I manage, we actually send um, immigration attorneys to different um, city council members' offices, and we're also, um, we have bases in about six um, centers on a full-time basis. Um, Medgar Evers is one of them. Um, and part of what I, you know, I prior to taking over managing the whole program, I was actually supervising the city council, um, the city college immigration center. And I was beyond shocked at how difficult it was for me to build relationships with the college itself. Because they saw me as just the immigration lawyer who was there to provide some service that the students didn't really need. Even though more than 50% of the people coming into the center were students. In addition to that, I would go out and, you know, <laughs> present about immigration and five people say, oh my God, I go to this college, and then, you know, my family are paying an attorney $5,000, $3,000, $2,000 to get me services. Um, so I think there is still a slight disconnect um, unfortunately, and I think a lot of the the seniors in the college uh, campuses are battling with a lot of different issues, right? Not to take away from them just how much is at stake. They have a lot of concerns. <coughs> Tuition is increasing. CUNY has to remain competitive. Um, the governor is not supportive of increasing funds. They're getting cuts from every angle. And so I think, unfortunately, they're dealing with so many issues that it's quite possible that the immigration issue is falling through the cracks because they don't realize just how important it is to as many of you. And so it might become wiser as you know, and I don't know who is in the best position to do that, but for the student population to start gathering, um, you know, to start kind of getting together behind immigration and then standing, you know, uniting on the topic and making it clear to the leaders, whether it's the college president or the DU students or you know, the um, governmental relations executives, that this matters to us. And so while you're discussing how to spend the funds from our tuition, whether you raise tuition or not, and all these other major issues, don't forget this, that through it all, our immigrant population in the CUNY system has to be protected. But you guys definitely have the power to do it, especially if you unite, you could move mountains. Okay, we are out of time, so I wanted to uh, end with a, a, a very short conclusion, which is that I think um, one thing that gets lost in all of these debates is that we, the, the media and scholars tend to focus on either the undeserving immigrants mm -hmm. or the super achievers, right? And there's a whole layer in the middle of people who are just getting by, who are not stellar students or, or 
became engineers after you know <laughs> becoming being janitors, who also deserve right to be here and deserve their rights and deserve to be protected. And I think we, we need to do a better job of, of filling in, right, the gap and, and, and having those stories also be told because those stories aren't told. If you're just, if you're just getting by, nobody cares. <laughs> you're not a criminal and you're not a superstar. Yeah. Um, but I think that that would also go a long way in, um, in kind of pushing for a more just kind of immigration system. So thank you for coming. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you.